You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Hey all, this is Scott O'Donohoe. I'm one of the pastors of the Village Church that gathers in downtown Hamilton, Ohio. And this is the final episode. I think it's episode number 12 where we're going through uh, the content of a class that I taught through back in May of 2021 called Not Our Own. And that class uh, happened on every Sunday morning in the month of May uh, for five weeks, and the goal of that was to cultivate clarity and compassion and an evangelistic community through conversations about gender and sexuality. And so we wanted to make the content of that class, even in, in an expanded form, a bit available for folks who weren't able to make it, uh, or even those who who were able to make it but maybe want to revisit some of it or go a little bit further in depth in the content or just in the long term for uh, for posterity's sake. We'll have something to point people to from this class. So, so this is the final episode as it relates to the specific content that we taught through. Um, there were lots of great questions, uh, lots of questions that I'm still answering and walking uh, with people through and all of that. And so uh, there is a really good chance that we'll have some more episodes down the road that are more question and response and addressing some of those things. Um, but as it relates to the actual content that we talked through together that was prepared, um, this is the last episode. And so today um, we're going to be talking about gender roles and gender expression. So uh, just to remind you of what those definitions are, uh, a gender role, um, we're talking about how males and females are expected to act in any given culture. And gender expression is is how a person does act or present themselves in any particular culture or time or what have you. So we're kind of moving beyond what it means to be someone of a particular sex or a particular gender, uh, moving beyond biological sex and gender identity, which is what we talked about the last couple episodes. We're moving to kind of what it means to then live as someone of a particular sex or gender. How does my maleness or my femaleness uh, or both or neither, how does that stuff show up in my life? Uh, For transgender folks, this is where um, conversations about transition can come up. So social transition uh, being about, you know, chosen names and chosen pronouns, clothes, uh, hair, all of that stuff. Or or, uh, hormonal transition, talking about puberty blockers uh, and cross-hormone therapy. Uh, Or surgical transition, uh, looking at sex reassignment surgery and those sorts of things. Uh, And we talked about those earlier in a a previous episode. Um, This is also for folks in the church where uh, where conversations about biblical manhood and biblical womanhood uh, come up. Oftentimes we talk about, you know, headship and submission and is uh, is pastoral ministry only for men or should moms work outside the home? Uh, Should stay-at-home dads be a thing? All that kind of stuff. And just people in general, uh, culture at large, like what is, what's masculine and what's feminine? Um, What are boy things and what are girl things? What could a a man do or wear or say that would be considered not manly? Uh, And same for women. What could women do or wear or say that would be considered like not womanly, not feminine? Um, I mean, if you were to go to Target, uh, browse the toy aisle, browse the, the clothing sections, uh, browse the, the jewelry, look at advertisements, look um, who are they showing you will wear this kind of thing or buy this kind of car uh, on TV or, or enjoy this kind of food or pursue this kind of hobby or the box office, uh, movies, Netflix, television. What are the what are the audiences? What are the, like, the target demographics for those shows? How do they even uh, come to that conclusion that that's who would watch those sorts of things and why? And is that inherently good or bad? Um, even just thinking about Mother's Day and Father's Day, which we recently celebrated here at the time of uh, this recording, how are those like distinctly commemorated or celebrated or talked about? Um, and, and why are those differences there? Uh, all of this from transition to biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, to to Target and holidays and culture at large, all that stuff points to the fact that gender isn't merely about checking a certain box uh, on your taxes or uh, job applications or surveys. It's not just a category that you call yourself by, but it has has some sort of bearing on the way that you live your life, the way that you express yourself and relate with other people. That's that's maybe more profound than we might realize. Um, When God made us in Genesis, made us embodied, sexed, imaged, um, the way that that's played out, not just in the scriptures, but not just in our culture, but in every culture, the significance of our gender goes beyond simply 
who we ought to sleep with for the sake of procreation, right? So the distinctions between the sexes has never only been reduced to that, like our role in sex or reproduction. And some might say that's for better or worse, but uh, regardless, even those who would consider themselves gender non-conforming, uh, trans or not, they, they simply don't conform to gender norms of the day, they don't feel like they fit in to those stereotypes, they themselves uh, often speak, uh, seek to express their, uh, their themselves in a way that more than likely kind of moves beyond their role in reproduction, uh, right, if, if they're even concerned with that, um, into other facets of their life. Whether they're breaking uh, with stereotypes of the day or not, gender, gender is something that is significantly expressed in a variety of ways across a, a variety of cultures. Um, who we are is tied to how we live. And in this question, as it relates to cisgender folks and transgender folks in the church, um, is a huge point of conversation and contention uh, when it comes to how Jesus has called us to live. How does he call us to live not just as humans, but as men and women specifically, whether cisgender or transgender? Well, while we're not responsible for the biological sex or the gender that we've received, we are responsible for what we do with it, how we express it. And for anybody who claims to follow Jesus, we all have to let our our understanding and expression of our gender be sanctified um, and submitted to the, the loving care and the leadership of Jesus. Who we are is tied to how we live. And, and while our gender is part of who we are, uh, Christians are ultimately identified by Jesus. So, so we're not merely men or women. We are Christ's. We are Christian men and Christian women. So how then should we live? Um, that's what we're going to take a look at in this particular episode. And this is, maybe this is even a little bit mushier of a topic than, than biological sex, certainly, uh, or even gender identity, but but it's like something that's really important that we need to explore. So um, the first big thing, the first big point I want to make is this, is that uh, gender roles and gender expressions are by and large oriented in some way around stereotypes. All right, so even the people that are against stereotypes are at times motivated by what what they're not, <laughs> what they're against, right? Um, it is impossible to escape stereotypes. To say that you're just going to express yourself without any kind of prior input or influence from the world around you, that just can't happen. Um, every culture from the Bible to today has stereotypes, and, and stereotypes aren't necessarily bad. Uh, they are simply descriptions of how many or how most men and women act, uh, but they're not necessarily prescriptions for how all men and women ought to behave or have to behave. Otherwise, you know, they're not really men or, or not really women in some way. Um, when, when stereotypes move from descriptions to prescriptions, that's when they can become hurtful. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But uh, many of these stereotypes are, are culturally defined. Uh, clothes, you know, what kind of clothes do you wear? Um, hairstyles of the day, how do you show affection? What kind of music do you like? Or uh, sports are you engaged in? Do you play? What are your even your favorite colors? Pink or blue? Pick one. Um, hobbies that you pursue. Uh, do you, like, are you quick to cry? Do you get angry? How do you show your anger? What kind of work do you do? All that stuff. These things can, whether, whether we like it or not, they can communicate some degree of masculinity or femininity in a given culture. And if you were to do the same things or, or wear the same clothes or behave the same way across various cultures across various time periods, um, you would send different signals <laughs> depending on where you were and who you were uh, around and, and when you were alive. Because what's masculine or feminine, uh, what's commonly expected to uh, or, or, expe or uh, accepted as normal among men or women, that's largely shaped um, differently from culture to culture to culture. And so like men, do you, do you greet one another with a holy kiss? Do you wear do you wear hats when you pray or uh, during Sunday gatherings? Um, coming out of COVID nineteen stuff, have you have you let your hair grow long? Or, or women, how long is your hair? Is it short? You have like a pixie cut? Or, or wives, do do you wear a head covering? Uh, in some ways, and some of you might. I, I know uh, I know women that do. These are all things that the authors of Scripture uh, speak to as normal or expected behavior among men and women in their particular culture. But uh, but but a kiss on the cheek among first century same-sex disciples on another continent would be received differently than it would be here today in Hamilton, Ohio, right? Uh, the same is true if, if any woman with a, a pixie cut hopped in a time machine and went back to the first century, or 
or if a wife without a head covering just went back a few decades to like the mid-20th century. Um, our modern expressions of masculinity or femininity would be offended and probably offensive to our biblical counterparts. And that's not wrong. Uh, that's not bad. That's, that's literally how culture works. That's how stereotypes function. Even the most culturally transcendent characteristics of men and women, be it uh, height, strength, hairiness, all that kind of stuff, um, those are based on generalities. They're not based on absolutes. Uh, it might be true, like most men are, are taller or stronger, hairier uh, than women are, but it's not true that, that all men are taller, stronger, or hairier than, than all women. That's just simply not true. There are women who are bigger than me, stronger than me, prob probably hairier than me. I have no idea. Um, but, but those are generalities. Those are not absolutes. All right. So this is an important thing for us to be mindful of um, as we begin talking about this stuff. So uh, one big, uh, like uh, one big point that I want to make of, of three that we'll go into is this: gender expression. As we kind of head into this stuff, gender expression doesn't determine someone's gender. Uh, all it can do is show it. It can it can show their gender. So having or adopting more masculine or feminine traits, interests. All that stuff, it can't make you a man or a woman, nor can it take away your maleness or your femaleness. Gender expression is just that, and it is, is it an expression of your gender. It's not the root of, of your manhood or your womanhood. It is the fruit. Gender roles are merely what you get when you describe the common characteristics of those individual gender expressions across a group of people. Um, it's how you form stereotypes, and when they're left to be simply a description of the majority, they're perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with making those observations. But kind of like we said earlier, when those descriptions move to prescriptions, when those observations of, of most men and women become just straight up definitions of what it means to, to be a man or a woman, that that's what, what all men or all women have to be, that's when we've crossed a line in some way. And, and when we think the fruit is the root, then something is off. And I think this happens a lot more often than, than we would actually like to admit. Um, so I want to speak to a couple of ways that this shows up today um, in the culture, for sure, maybe within uh, maybe the more affirming side of the LGBTQ community. And then uh, more importantly for me and, and maybe my direct audience is like in the church. Uh, I want to talk about how that shows up in the church as well. So um, gender expression, like I said, does not determine someone's gender. All it can do is show it, uh, which means that when it comes to discerning gender identity, uh, we just have to be really mindful of how much persuasive power we're giving to what are merely facets of gender expression. Interests, clothing, uh, the way that we relate to other people, like and trying to figure that out and trying to figure out our gender identity. Um, gender nonconformity is a thing. And it's, it's one thing, for example, for like a biological male to not fit the cultural stereotypes for men. Uh, that's one thing. It's another thing for a biological male to say he's not a man. That's a significant distinction. Uh, I think that's something we would all agree with, and I think it's one that we should want to keep distinct for the good of, of everybody, uh, apart, from, apart from gender dysphoria um, or what we can only describe as, as an inner sense of self, how significant are facets of gender expression in helping us figure out what my or what someone else's, even like kids, um, how significant is gender expression in our determination of, of gender identity? Um, we hit on this a bit in the last episode, so I won't linger on this point. Um, and I make it really clear that I ask that I ask that stuff not to call people's trans identity into question or anything, but to help us be consistent in the way that we all think about what it means to be a man or a woman, um, cisgender or transgender or, or gender queer. I think clarity and consistency across the board, as much as it's possible, is only going to help us in understanding each other um, and maybe even operating from the same page or at least from the same book in some way around gender stuff. Which kind of leads me to another thing we haven't talked about yet um, related to this as it relates directly with the trans community. And that is clarifying what transition is um, and what it isn't. So social transitioning, uh, that's one thing. Again, that's uh, chosen names, chosen pronouns, clothing, those sorts of things. And we'll, we'll come back to that uh, later in this episode. Um, categorizing them as a looking at hormonal and surgical transitioning, kind of categorizing these other forms of things as forms of gender expression, um, it is kind of naively blurring lines at best, and at worst it could actually be like just intellectually dishonest. 
um, distinctions between biological males and females in our endocrine systems. Uh, you know, the, the hormones, hormone levels uh, our, our body produces, our sexual anatomy, not just internal reproductive organs, but external ones as well. Um, the way our bodies are distinctly shaped. The, these are all components of our biological sex, woven into our genes, received by us, not, not made, not chosen by us at all. These things honestly do not belong in the category of gender expression, um, as if they're intended to be malleable or changeable or, or interchangeable in some way. These things belong to the category of, of biological sex, not gender expression. But by talking about hormonal and surgical transition as matters of gender expression, as is often the case. We, we willingly, maybe without even knowing it, we, we blur the line between these two things and let these things live kind of in, in both camps. Um, and, and yes, I know like science can do a lot of things. Uh, it's made a lot of things possible that by nature would not be possible. Uh, good things, right? But, but there's a whole world of ethics at play and how much we should use science to remake or redefine our very bodies, and, and there are very real limits, uh, at least at, at this point in time, to what even the best hormonal and surgical options can do. It can't change chromosomes. It, biological males can't produce eggs. Biological females can't produce sperm. Like th there is, there is a, a facade of autonomy and sovereignty that we can try to express over our bodies in some way, but it it hits a ceiling pretty quickly. Um, and, and I think it's because these things, when we categorize them as gender expression, that they are seeking in some ways to determine our gender, or, or at least erase the traces of our biological sex and replace them with something different. All right. So now, for those who experience like gender dysphoria and are approaching like all of this from a like a, a purely clinical, pragmatic, like therapeutic perspective, I can absolutely see how hormonal and surgical transition can be a form of treatment. Right, to alleviate symptoms of gender dysphoria. And, and like we talked about in a previous episode, uh, there, there's data to support that. Like it can be effective. It, it's not always effective. Uh, it doesn't always deal with co-occurring issues and it's not without potential new issues being uh, kind of diagnosed after the fact. But, but this whole conversation is it's much more complicated and much more important and much more personal than, than we can dive into even in this episode, um, especially when suffering um, especially to the, the degree of like self-harm and suicidality when those things are at play um, in, in this whole reality. And yet, like at, at the same time, at no point should we ever ignore ethical questions and concerns or be comfortable kind of confusing categories along the way. Um, so you might wonder why I bring this up without having like a some sort of answer or resolution, and that's fair, but um, I'm trying to be humble enough before you guys to know that, that I can't offer that answer. Um, and I'm also trying to be humble enough before the Lord to say, like, hey, we need to be more careful in the way that we think about this stuff. Truth matters, categories matter, um, consistency matters. And so that ambition doesn't always uh, come with easy answers, but I think the pursuit, um, faithfulness, and a desire to love the Lord and to love our neighbor well, um, I think that's worthwhile even when it's not clean or, or simple. All right. So on to some stuff now kind of related to the church and this whole idea that, that gender expression doesn't determine someone's gender. All I can do is show it. Let, let's talk about church stuff for a minute. Uh, men and women, for a variety of reasons, they think they have to fit a particular mold. Um, otherwise, they're not really a man or not really a woman. And today that could mean literally, as in like, I'm not sure if I'm an actual man uh, because I'm, I'm not into what my culture considers manly. Uh, or we could talk about this figuratively, figuratively, as in like, I'm not sure if I'm a, a quote-unquote real man, um, manly or, or masculine, because I'm not into the things that my culture considers manly. And so uh, all this does when we kind of confuse these things is that it cultivates shame and guilt where there shouldn't be any. Like this whole idea of having to fit a mold to actually be a man or to be a, a manly man or to be a woman or a feminine woman. Uh, it cultivates shame and guilt where there should be none. Um, it, it can ostracize folks from entire communities. It can cause folks to overcompensate by focusing their efforts on outward appearances or behaviors or something just in order to, to belong or to be accepted. And, and in a culture where it is, it is more acceptable to even just self-identify as transgender and, and where we see like the, the swift rise of rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, we talked about that in a previous episode, especially among like young folks uh, and the, the subsequent like detransitioning movement as well. It can, this can actually contribute to the confusion around what it means to be a man or a woman uh, that, that the church sometimes loved to point fingers at. 
right? But all of this can happen within the church and through the church, where our our works and our personalities and our interests, those things should not be the basis of our acceptance. Jesus gets to be that. Um, church where we shouldn't feel shame or be ostracized or or be motivated by guilt because the gospel like dismantles the power of guilt and shame as as motivators in our life where we shouldn't tag on extra biblical stereotypical stuff to what it means to be a man. Um, descriptions that Jesus himself wouldn't hold up to when we have this like his whole life in the range of his words and behaviors and emotions and ambitions, all that stuff in view. But but the church can honestly and has honestly baptized cultural masculinity and femininity or, or some like Christianese subculture version of it. Um, and it's called it biblical manhood or biblical womanhood. Uh, not to the building up of every man or every woman in the church, but to the promotion and the protection of a particular kind of man or a particular kind of woman, some stereotype. Uh, and say every man should be like this and every woman should be like this. And, and I, I think it's often done with good intentions. Uh, not always, but I think most of the time it's done with good intentions. But it can be destructive when men and women see this ideal picture of other men and women, and then like hitch it to what it means to even just be a faithful follower of Jesus, to be a, a Christian man or a Christian woman, as if obedience and sanctification will, if it's actually happening, if we're really listening to the Spirit, it, it'll make us into the image of that guy or that girl, and not simply into the image of Jesus. And so it's it's no wonder that trans men and trans women and even just gender non-conforming folks that, that are cisgender, like might have a hard time seeing themselves in a church or, or part of a community or even following Jesus if they have to be a certain kind of man or a certain kind of woman in order to belong or, or to lead or to be seen as a valuable member of the community. And, and again, I think this happens often with good intentions, but that makes it all the more important for us in the church to actively fight against the baptism of, of cultural gender stereotypes in our discipleship communities and in our churches because that's going to be the way that we drift. All right? That's going to come naturally to us most, those stereotypes. It's, it's going to feel normal to us. But as we said in an earlier episode towards the very beginning of the series, that the Spirit's job is to literally sanctify normal because what's normal today in a fallen world has nothing to do with Jesus. So, so we actively have to make sure that the image of Jesus like that's the one that we're calling people to by by letting Jesus challenge what we're expecting and what we're calling others to in our discipleship, particularly around manhood and womanhood. Um, the, the church genuinely has to take responsibility for our part in actually contributing to today's gender confusion by re- by repenting of how we've esteemed stereotypes um, instead of scripture, and by replacing those things uh, for both men and women with with Jesus Himself. All right, so, so that is a thing that the church needs to be mindful of in this particular conversation. So uh, I want to move on to like a, a second big thing to, to hit on here, and that is that, um, and this first point kind of leads me here, is that, that Scripture is more concerned with godliness than masculinity or femininity. All right, that there is much ado about biblical manhood and womanhood <laughs> these days, uh, and, and honestly probably always will be, but to be frank, like I could probably count on one hand, uh, maybe two, the, the number of moral commands in the scriptures given only to either men or women that aren't elsewhere in some other way prescribed for the other sex. We, we do see in the scriptures like certain direct things at men and at women, uh, husbands, wives, moms, dads, all that stuff. But by and large, what it calls one gender to do in one place, it, it asks the same thing of the other gender somewhere else. Before you freak out, like we at the village, we uphold what are clear distinctions in the scriptures: headship uh, of husbands in the covenant of marriage, headship of pastors in in the covenant of local church membership. Only men can be husbands uh, who will be held responsible for the way that they help their family flourish, um, and and only qualified men can be pastors who set doctrine or are called to account for the care of their members. And, and that includes submission of wives in marriage and submission of church members and local church membership stuff. Uh, and, and as much as I would like to and how all that stuff always brings up questions, we can't dig into all that right now. But, but those things are clear. The things that are clear in scripture are clear. There are distinctions. But to come back to the big idea, scripture is way more concerned with godliness than like masculinity or femininity. It, to say it another way, to be a biblical man or a biblical woman is not to differentiate yourself from everyone of the opposite sex, 
but rather to conform yourself to the image of Christ. All right, Christian morality, ethics, uh, character, fruit of the Spirit, mission, all that stuff, those things aren't gendered. They're not sex. They are universal calls to everyone. And so when we make the universal appeal for folks to believe the gospel and to follow Jesus, we're not asking folks to suddenly start remaking themselves into the image of you know, some Susie Homemaker or like Macho McMuscles or whatever. We're calling them to be conformed to the image of Christ, to become more like Jesus, and in doing so, to become more like themselves, the way that the Lord intended, sanctified, freed from sin, empowered by the Spirit, on mission for the gospel and making disciples. And so I won't belabor the point, but by and large, the the fixation that some segments of Christianity have on like advancing a, a biblical manhood or a biblical womanhood that's just it's not merely built on stereotypes, but that, that that emphasize and define biblical manhood and womanhood by all the ways that we ought to be uh, and live differently from one another. That's honestly a distraction <laughs> and an exercise in, in missing the point. And to be clear, like this is not an argument against upholding biblical distinctions between men and women, uh, especially in a culture that's defining those things very differently uh, and in brand new ways. But but this is an argument for not missing the forest for the trees. Uh, that the message of the scriptures is much more loudly from Genesis onward how much men and women are equal partners being made and remade, sanctified, and in his same image on the same sacred mission with the same God. So, so scripture is more concerned with godliness than masculinity or femininity. And yet that said, and this is the third point here, uh, the scriptures do encourage men and women to uphold gender distinctions. Um, and that long and like really strange weird passage about uh, head coverings that I kind of referenced earlier, that's, that's 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 2 through 16, by the way. Uh, Paul talks about how men shouldn't cover their heads, but, but women should. And men shouldn't have long hair, but women should. And he ties all of that stuff to the order of creation and what seems natural. Uh, and in the Old Testament, we, we can look at passages like Deuteronomy 22, 5, and it says that uh, a woman shall not wear a man's garment. Nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. All right, so while we don't have time to get in the weeds of these two passages, they're pretty interesting, to be honest, especially the 1 Corinthians 11 stuff. There's so much stuff to get into there. Uh, I mean, the, the thrust of both of these passages and others like them isn't that girlfriends can't borrow their boyfriend's sweatshirts <laughs> or, that, or that men can't pray and wear a hat at the same time, like the, the hat gets in the way of the prayer going up. The, the principle underneath these passages is that men and women shouldn't go out of their way to buck gender norms for the sake of just bucking gender norms or, or to try and present themselves as the opposite sex or to make it seem like they're doing that. The idea is that they, they should present themselves as a people who have willingly received the sex, the gender that God's given them or that they, they simply have, that they should be more concerned with respecting and honoring the Lord and their spouse, and their community, in whatever ways culturally express that, uh, th then with expressing their individual individuality, however they want to, no matter how it makes people feel, or how others interpret it, or what have you. And so gender expression doesn't determine our gender, and the scriptures are far more concerned with godliness than our obsession with biblical manhood and womanhood. And it's because of both of those things, that our, that our biological sex and gender identity are received, and that our goal is to let the Lord shape us uh, it's because of both of those things that we should not, like Adam and Eve did, and, and like we're prone to do, live in rejection of that received order, or, or to live as if we reject that order. So who we are and, and who God calls us to be should shape the way that we live and the way that we express ourselves. And so practically, what does that, what does that actually mean? Um, and there aren't really easy answers to this. It'd be really easy to tell you that girls should wear this and boys should do this and you know, wives should be this way and husbands should be like this, but, but that would be wildly subjective <laughs> from me. And it wouldn't be helpful for trans folks and it would honestly just lead to legalism. Um, am I doing all the right things to be a man or am I doing all the things I need to do to be a woman, which is like the kind of thing that we're trying to avoid here. And so and instead we have to consider others and we have to consider ourselves for the sake of the Lord. Um, throughout the scriptures, especially in passages like 1 Corinthians 8-10 through 10, uh, and Romans 14, we're called to be mindful of our own intentions as well as the impact that we might have on others. Um, if, if we don't have a clean conscience about something, if we're outside the bounds of scripture, then, then we are in the wrong and we need to repent. 
But even if my conscience is clean and I am personally within the bounds of Scripture, if, if what I'm doing is causing my brother or sister in Christ to stumble or if it's somehow communicating to the, the unbelieving world around me that I'm affirming of something that's explicitly idolatrous, then, then I am still in the wrong. Like even if my intentions are good, I still have to be mindful of my impact and, and be willing to lay down my preferences or my freedom in Christ for the sake of, of one other person, like our, our weaker brother or just the community at large. And to be clear, this isn't like a, a gender and sexuality specific ethic. This is a basic Christian ethic that spans every facet of our life together. What, what we eat or don't eat, what holidays we celebrate or don't celebrate, that's the kind of stuff we see talked about in the scriptures around these things, and, and it covers everything. Um, but it certainly includes gender and sexuality as well, including our gender expression. And so kind of where I want to take this, what I want to leave you with are, are a couple questions to help you think about this stuff. Um, maybe a, a final word or, or declaration of some sort. And then like just what the church needs to make room for um, it, with all this stuff. So here's the first thing. Uh, we, we just have to ask ourselves if we're willing to receive what we have received. Um, in all of its order and in all of its disorder when it comes to our biological sex or our gender identity. Um, I and the Lord, we're not asking you to receive something perfect. God's order has been filtered through the fall for all of us. Every single person. It doesn't matter how you identify or what. That, that's true for all of us. And I'm not asking you to receive something easy as if it's clear how everything plays out or, or as, as if that's all going to come naturally to you, whether you're cisgender or transgender or something else. But are you willing to receive who you are and, and how you are right now and all of the clarity and with all the confusion so that you might let the Lord lead you in expressing that in a way that, that aligns with him and his word, that's pursuing after godliness, that leaves you with a, a clear conscience when you lay your life against the scriptures and that points to your trust in him as your savior and your king and, and evaluating your intention uh, your, your conscience, are you living as if that's true? And this doesn't mean like hard and fast gender conformity, making you into the image of, you know, again, some stereotypical Christian man or woman. It's it's not a sin to not fit into a, a mold, but but are you going out of your way to try and break that mold? Are you trying to smash it? <laughs> Have you turned your nose up at it in some way? Or are you or are you chasing it? Like more than Jesus, are you trying to make yourself into the image of someone or something else? The The scriptures would call out both of these things. And in the case of trans folks, like I said last time, I, I believe there is a priority that should be given to biological sex over and above our gender identity. And, and this plays out a lot in the way that we express ourselves, express our gender. I already talked about hormonal and surgical transition stuff in this episode. And, and I, think, uh, I think this would call us to pattern our social expression after our biological sex as well, meaning our, our pronouns and, and the names that we go by and the clothes that we wear and how we wear our hair and just present ourselves in general. I think this calls us to pattern our social expression after our biological sex. And that's a, a, a very unnuanced kind of rule of thumb or general blanket statement. But man, gender dysphoria, um, particularly the more severe it is, it, it complicates this for sure. Not every issue is a, a cookie cutter thing. Um, when it comes to, to you referring to yourself a certain way or, or wearing a certain thing versus like someone's physical safety, like if self-harm and suicidality are in the picture, then I'm going to choose encouraging someone to do what is physically safe for them, like every single time. This is an instance, <laughs> there are lots of instances like this, but this is one in particular where ideals can clash um, and ethics, like real life moral dilemmas, they come into play. Um, and again, this, this isn't easy, and it, but it's very real uh, at the same time. That said, like, I'm comfortable uh, with, with everything that we've talked about across all of these episodes that we've done this series, with, with counseling folks, by and large, to express themselves according to the patterns of, of their biological sex. Um, and not merely just in doing that, like going through the motions, but working it out with the Lord to be able to, to do that from a place of wanting to receive not merely just a particular order, but, but His grace and his mercy, his truth, his leadership as he walks with you through those things. Those things that might be incredibly hard and confusing. All right. Uh, and secondly, um, you need to evaluate your intent. Like what is, what is your, um, as we evaluate your intent, you need to evaluate your, your impact rather uh, on the community around you. So you might have a, a clear conscience in the way that you express yourself. 
right? But how will the people around you experience that? Will they, will they hear the same message or will they see the same devotion to the Lord that you might, that you might experience internally? This, isn't, this is not like living in fear or asking you not to be yourself. Uh, this is a call to die to yourself, uh, to, to your preferences, to lay down your liberties for the sake of others. This is a fundamental aspect of basic Christian discipleship, and it's a crucial aspect of any kind of truly gospel-centered community. If we do the opposite of this, if we just say, like, I'm going to do whatever works for me and, and fight for my preferences and not give up what, what I want or how I want to live, if everyone approaches relationships and community this way, then it all just crumbles to the ground. You don't actually have community. You just have a bunch of people fighting for their preferences. But, but who we are, it's, it's servants and disciples of Jesus who, who laid down every liberty that, that might come with actually being God in order to accommodate us, to invite us in, to build a community of people that could be vastly different in a million ways and yet united in what matters most, which is the Lord himself. So how is the kind of masculinity or femininity that, that you're expressing, that you're building up, that you're inviting people into, how is this impacting the people around you? It, it might work for you, but does it work for the people around you? Is it causing your, your brother and sister, be they cisgender or transgender or what have you, could it cause them to stumble in their faith? Is it unnecessarily excluding or ostracizing other people? Are the things that you say and do and partake in, even with a clean conscience, would others confuse this with you affirming something that's against the clear teachings of Scripture? Would they assume that you worship a God who's different from how he's revealed himself in the Word? Or, or that you worship someone or something else altogether? Is it Jesus that people are drawn to in the way that you live, even in the way that you express your gender? All right, so these aren't exhaustive questions or the only things to think about here, intent and impact, but they, but they do get us on the right track as we're considering how we ought to live in light of our sex and gender. And I think they reveal just how complicated and diverse all of this stuff really is. We, we might have the same exact theological convictions, the same exact view of the scriptures, our aim and, and mission and discipleship, and we can come to some very different conclusions for our life or for the, the life of our community. And you know what? Like That is exactly what the early church was dealing with and doing. That's why Paul wrote things like 1 Corinthians 8-10 through and Romans 14. Go read those chapters, right? And so it's actually in asking those questions and wrestling with those things that we should find encouragement, not discouragement, because this is the work of not just the church from the get-go, but of even Jesus himself who calls a diverse group of people to himself and seeks to build one family from it. And this is where the church needs to make room for folks to work this stuff out. Over time, slowly, in ways that that might be different than you, even though they're rooted in the very same convictions, or even to give space for people who don't hold the same convictions to learn and grow and walk alongside of you. Would would trans folks, and just those that don't fit the stereotypical man or woman, would would they find in your local church or in your small group or, or just in your presence, would they find a place to experience the grace and the truth of God that that is steadfast and patient and that's born through the the fruit of the Spirit that's showing up in you? Or would they find a place that asks them to either conform or leave? We We don't have to compromise on truth or the inspiration of Scripture or the gospel to let folks figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus while they're among us <laughs> and also with us. They get to do that with us. We're, we're not compromising on any of those things when we stop assuming that people should follow Jesus before they even trust him or that their sanctification is going to follow the same path and timeline as our own. It's, it's actually in laying down these assumptions that we're able to believe the gospel and build a gospel-centered community that is able to invite and sustain a group of people that is vastly different in many, many areas except for their faith and their hope in Jesus. And so to land this plane, um, I just want to conclude with this. Just as as I said when it came to sexuality, um, I believe that it's biblically, empirically, experientially consistent to say that it is is possible to live faithfully with Jesus and with the church, to lead, to make disciples with a gender identity that's not congruent with your biological sex. All right, similar to sexual orientation, experiencing a gender identity that's incongruent with your biological sex in some way is not order actively rejected. It's disorder passively 
receive. It's not a sin to experience that misalignment, let alone like gender dysphoria. That's, that's suffering. It's not a sin to simply be gender non-conforming, like just meaning that we don't naturally fit into the stereotypical you know, mold of a guy or girl. That's, that's not a sin. Now, choosing to reject the order that you have received, trying to break the mold or living in a way that communicates a rejection of your unambiguous biological sex, if that's you, that is, in a, again, in a very broad, non-nuanced sense, that, that is rejection. I would say that that's sin. But but you submit gender dysphoria and, and some other things into play here, and this becomes incredibly tricky because what might look to some people like a, a compromise or a rejection of some kind of order in somebody's life, like it could actually be a huge work of sanctification and sacrifice and faithfulness at great like mental, emotional, physical, relational cost for them to, for them to point more towards a truth than maybe anything inside them wants to admit, let alone allow. And so that inner conflict, not, not even being a product of their own will or agency, but something that they've passively received, what they're actively doing might be a wild and radical act of obedience that to some of us, especially cisgender folks, comes naturally. We should not make assumptions, nor should we downplay what many trans folks do to just bear with the church and live faithfully with Jesus. It should be something that we encourage, and their stories honestly should be something that, that we're edified by. Those who choose to lay down their lives and faithfully follow after Jesus despite the struggles that they're enduring. We should do all that we can to recognize not stereotypes, not to measure the sanctification or obedience of others uh, based on ourselves, but to look for godliness, right? And to hope for more than anything else, like good fruit to be born in us so that others, especially those on the margins, might find hope and life and a space, not just to follow Jesus, but to enjoy him with his people. So look, we talked about through this series, man, hit on 1 Corinthians 6, the fact that our gender, our sexuality, our desires, our urges, what comes naturally to us or unnaturally to us, those things do not define us. Our history, our past, our present, no relationship can actually define who we are. Jesus ultimately is the one who defines us. We are not our own. We've been bought with a, a price and we are cherished by him. We saw in Genesis 1 through 3 that, that God goes with us into the hard places, right? That, that he goes with us into all the places that are difficult. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't leave us to fend for ourselves, but he goes with us into those difficult moments, difficult days, difficult years, difficult relationships. He goes with us there to provide us with what it is that we need most importantly, him. And as the church, we get to be a family that, as Jesus said, that there's nobody who's going to, uh, you know, give up uh, mother, daughter, uh, dad, son, family, lands, all that. So there's nobody who's going to give that stuff up in this life for the sake of the gospel who won't receive all of that a hundredfold, tenfold. Like he, he says that. And so we get to be that family. We get to be the fulfillment of that promise that, that people in the LGBTQ community, they get to experience that through us. That's who we should be. We get to be a sanctuary in the midst of those hard places with the good news that one day order will be restored. Disorder will be reordered. What's natural will be what's just good. Suffering will be a, a thing of the past and the, and the things that get in the way of our enjoyment and our belief and our belonging in Christ will one day be no more. And so thanks if you've listened to all these episodes. Uh, man, I can't thank you enough for bearing with me uh, through all that stuff. I hope that they've been helpful to you in some way. Um, again, info at myvillagechurch.com. If you have questions for me or any of us here at the village, just want to reach out for help, whatever it is that you need. You want to send, send me an angry email, uh, feel free to do that. Um, but man, I, I pray that this has been a blessing to the church um, and a blessing to anybody that might be listening to this, whether you're a Christian or not, wherever you come from, um, I pray that this has been helpful. And so, uh, like I said, this may not be the last episode in this series. We might do some Q&R stuff uh, down the road. At least I hope to do some of that stuff. But as for content recaps of our class, uh, this kind of puts an end to that series. And so, man, thanks again for listening. Uh, and hopefully uh, I'll see you on the next one.